Texas. Um, what's on my heart today is labor and rest. Those two thoughts, labor and rest. We'll begin reading now from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, reading through verse 30. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is a very comforting verse of scripture that we often think about, but um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that he says, All ye that labor, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, and I will give you rest. The rest here is conditional upon us laboring. And that is what is on my heart to speak about is the truth that labor and rest go together. That there is laboring and then there is rest. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 12 says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. And... Uh, I want to talk for a second about literal laboring, literal work. I believe it is godly for us to be hard workers at our jobs and at our homes, taking care of the things that God has given us, being good stewards of the literal things that God has given us. We need to be hard workers in a literal sense. And I just want you to think about it for a moment. I know it's true with me. Um, Brother Brooks spoke about this, and it really, it really resonated with me, um, this truth. Think about the hard days where you've spent a long, hard day working. That night, I know I've experienced this, um, you probably got a really good night's rest after you worked hard that day. Um, I think that there's a reason for that, because if you labor hard, you get tired, and then you're able to fall asleep. Um, it's a very great blessing, labor is and rest is. Think about the creation of this world. When God created the world, he worked six days and then he rested the seventh day. And this is what our work, this is what our week is based on, our seven day week. I believe literally we should be working hard and then taking one day, the Sabbath day, to reflect on God and to rest. In Exodus chapter 20, we are commanded to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And then he says, Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, we are to work for six days, and then we are to rest, and it's a blessing to rest. I want to point out as well that um, in, in our country, we have a great blessing of having, in general, most of us have five, a five-day work day, and then the weekend of two days. But I want to encourage you that we follow God's pattern in his word that we work our five day work day and then don't sit around and rest for two whole days doing nothing. Um, I'm thankful that we only have, don't get me wrong, I don't think all of us should go ask our boss for a six day of work, but after we work our five day work day, then don't waste that extra day that we have that we could be working and doing other things for God and um, around your house. I know that whenever I spend a Saturday doing absolutely nothing, that night, I don't get very good rest. So um, I encourage you, whenever you have days off, to continue working, but take the Sabbath day, rest on that day, and focus on God and His blessings. Um, whenever I was a kid, my daddy told me this, and all of you have probably heard it before, the, the truth that comes from God's Word, that you work before you play. Whenever I got home, if I wanted to go outside and play with my friends or do something else, um, I'd be in big trouble if I hadn't already done my homework from school. 
I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we need to work before we play, before we have leisure, before we have rest. We should work first. Um, so literally, we need to be working with our hands. Um, I want to bring your attention to those, though, that seem like they're working hard, those busy bodies. We're not to be busy bodies. Um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, um, let's turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Paul here um, is writing to the Thessalonians, and he reminds them of whenever he came to them, he did not sit around and do nothing and expect them to do everything for him as an example for them to follow. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from er every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, and then listen carefully to verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And we've, we've heard that before. If a man is not willing to work, neither should he eat. That is biblical. That is truth. We need to labor for our leisure and for our food. And Paul gave a great example here, but continuing. So, if any would not work, neither should he eat. In verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So, um, I caution, caution you to not pretend like you're working and speak about all the hard work that you have to do, but to work in quiet and um, to work for God, to His glory, and then he will give you rest. But not, don't be busybodies. Don't pretend to work um, and talk about the work that you do. Now just like we need to labor literally in real life um, with our hands, we need to work six days and rest on the seventh day, I believe the same truth applies spiritually. That if we labor and we come unto him in a spiritual sense, we're laboring for the cause of Christ, he will give us rest in our soul. We will have rest in our spirit. Um, but we need to do the spiritual labors every day, just like we need to work at our jobs hard every day. Don't turn there, but in Matthew chapter 25, we have a parable, and he gives a list of all these things that um, the men of God that were righteous had done for God. It says... Jesus says, I was hungered, and he gave me meat, thirsty, and he gave me drink, a stranger, and he took me in, naked, and he clothed me, sick, and he visited me, in prison, and he came unto me. And then in the parable, these saints, um, they said, when did we ever do this to you, God? They, instead of just taking the credit for all of that, they couldn't remember whenever they did all those good things for Jesus. So I said, when did we do this to you? And Jesus said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So our spiritual laboring, on top of our physical laboring that we do at our jobs and in our homes, our spiritual laboring, one of the main laborings we need to do is working for the people of God, the little ones of God. We need to be helping them, feeding others, those that are poor and needy, we need to be helping them. We need to visit them. Um, James chapter 1 verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. 
and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Um, I try to go to the nursing home. I don't do it as much as I should. But I think that's one thing, one labor that we could do for the cause of Christ that everyone in here could do. And it, it brings more blessing on me whenever I go than I believe it does for them. I hope that they are blessed too. But whenever I go, I leave there with this rest and peace in my soul from God after laboring for Him at the nursing home. We should all do that more. Um, that is affliction to be away from your home and your family. Um, the Lord blesses in the nursing home. It can be home for them and they, they make friends. But they, they need visitors. They need those to go to them. Many in our congregation um, have gone through great troubles and afflictions. and uh, We should be visiting them. Um, we, just, we need to visit each other whenever we're in trouble. Not just pray for them. I want you to notice, we should be praying for them, but we shouldn't just be praying for them and thinking about them and saying to each other, oh, I just hope they get better. We need to go do for them, make meals for each other, um, and just go and be with them. Turn to, um, well, let's not turn there yet. In James chapter 2, it talks about how um, we, we see that people have need and then we say to them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. And that does no good. So whenever we just think about the people, praying for them is very good too. That is a labor that we need to do. But whenever we just think about them and say, oh, I hope you feel better. That is not the type of labor I want to focus on. We need to be doing for them. Because what does it profit if we just say to go in peace and be warmed? Um, likewise, the scripture says, even so faith, if it hath not works is dead, being alone. So work, labor, in faith, um, and we'll find rest. But prayers, should we keep people in our prayers? Is, is praying a labor? It most definitely is. Paul mentioned in his letter, in the Coloss Colossians letter, that he is always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And then, of course, a three-word verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. I want you to think about that. That is a labor, to pray without ceasing. That is a labor that we need to do. Praying is a labor. And um, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Without ceasing, this is Paul, without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Night and day. It's working night and day to pray. So that is a labor that we need to be doing in order to experience the rest in our soul. One labor that we can all do more of that we'll never get enough of is laboring in God's Word. Laboring in our study of God's Word. I encourage you all to study God's Word daily and intently and fervently with much prayer. Don't just read through it, but study the Word of God. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And this idea of studying the Word of God and it being a labor. And remember that I said with labor, it is followed with rest. In Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law. Even, even not forgetting something is a labor. I want you to think about that. We have to constantly bring it back into our mind. So forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. This is a labor. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Skip down now to verse 22. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 22. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Remember that laboring brings sweet sleep. If we labor in the Word of God, 
we will not be afraid, but we'll have sweet sleep. Um, often, whenever, I'm sure you experience the same thing, whenever we lay down to go to sleep, sometimes our minds go crazy, and we start worrying about this or that, and we can't find any rest. We can't find any peace in our soul. This is different than the not being able to sleep because we did nothing all day long. That is true too. If we don't work with our hands and feet, we probably won't be able to sleep because we won't be tired physically. Well, in our soul, if we don't read the Word of God, and if we don't learn the truths of God and labor in the Word of God, whenever we go down to sleep, we're going to be, in our mind and in our spirit, we're going to be so uneasy and without any rest and unpeaceful, and we won't be able to sleep. But if we labor in the Word of God, we will not be afraid but our sleep will be sweet. And I want to go ahead and read the next two verses there. Verse 25 and 26. This is something we can learn from laboring in the Word of God. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Uh, there's many other passages. I just think it's interesting that that is right under what I went to. But many passages in the Word of God tell us not to worry. We can find peace and rest in our spirit if we labor in the Word of God. Because we know that God takes care of the sparrow. He clothes the flowers in the field. And uh, we'll be able to sleep sweetly. We'll be able to have that rest if we labor in God's Word. Um, there are many other labors we need to be doing. We need to be laboring for the people. We need to be laboring in God's word and in fervent prayer. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 9 now. Matthew chapter 9. We'll begin reading in verse 33. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 33. I want you to notice these are the works of Jesus. If we want to know how to labor in the cause of Christ then we need to look at what Jesus did. And there's many other works that Jesus did. But starting in verse 33, this is Matthew chapter 9, verse 33. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I want you to think about the, what Jesus did here. He, he, um, he cast out devils. He taught and he preached and he healed sicknesses and every disease. Now, I, I don't believe God has given us the, the ability to literally heal disease, a, a physical disease. But, if we think about it in a spiritual labor, we do have the ability to cast out these devil, these spirits of um, evil. Brother Clay tried to preach about that. We can work with our fellow brethren, teach them from God's word, and we can help. God will cast out the devils and the spirits of evil in people by our laboring in Christ. So we can do these kind of works. We can heal sickness. There are many people sick with sin. They are in chains in sin, and they don't, they don't know. And we can go and unwrap that cloth from around them that's holding them, the cloths of sin. We can break them out of the chains of sin. These are labors that we can do. We can heal the sick by the grace of God. God will heal the sick through us laboring with them. Um, let's continue to read now. So think about Jesus' works, and then look at verse 35, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then, he say, then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The harvest uh, in America today and all around us, in Waycross, Georgia, in our neighborhoods, in our families, the harvest is plenteous. Um, we need to be laboring with our hands and laboring spiritually with those around us to get, break them from the bonds of sin, 
to help them that oppose themselves, instruct them in meekness. These are labors that we need to be doing. Um, and there are many people that need these labors. And I, I fear, I'm fearful that none of us are the laborers that we should be. Um, there's not enough laborers right now. We need to pray for God to help us to be better laborers. I have one other thought that I, I would like to go to about laboring. I want you to think for a moment about what hinders us from laboring. Literal laboring, physical laboring at our jobs, and uh, laboring spiritually for the cause of Christ. What are some things that hinder us from doing that, that keep us back, that cause us to not want to labor? Um, I think laziness, we're not going to go to a scripture here, but laziness, uh, our, our selfish desire to have rest, causes us to not want to labor physically and spiritually. And the uh, irony of that is, if we are lazy and we're trying to get more rest, we won't find any rest. That's, an, that's a beautiful irony the Lord has shown me. But if we will work, if we'll work hard every day, we'll find that rest that lazy people want to find so much. So I encourage you to get past laziness. If, lazy, if you're lazy and that's causing you to not want to work, push that aside and think about the truth that if you labor, you'll find that rest that you so want. There's another thing that I think is more likely in my, in my life and in probably many others here. Um, turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And you've probably thought of many other things. There are many things that keep us in our minds, the lies of the devil that keep us from laboring. I, I hope you're encouraged that if you labor, you'll find rest. So anything else that's come across your mind that will keep you from laboring, I encourage you to pray and to get that thought out of your mind. And labor, and you'll, you'll see there's great blessing in laboring. But in Hebrews chapter 3, this is one that we probably wouldn't think about so often. That's probably a number one reason we don't labor. Starting in verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So he's referring to those in the wilderness, um, the children of Israel, before they went into the promised land. And he says, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in to the rest. They could not enter into the rest because of unbelief. And then chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Now I want you to think back to the children of Israel and the specific instance that caused them. It says here that they did not enter in because of their unbelief. Well, what didn't they believe? The children of Israel, um, they sent out spies. They were about to enter into this great land, the promised land, this land of rest that he's referring to. And he, they sent out spies, and whenever the spies returned, the spies spoke of that it was surely flowing with milk and honey, but then they spoke about the strong people in it. He says, the spies said, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So, um... Think about that. They, they were saying it was a land. It's the land that we want. It's that land of rest and milk and honey. But there's people that are too strong. We, we would never make it. And Caleb, he's the only one that stood up and said, Let us go up and at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the people said again that they were stronger and that they were giants and that we were like grasshoppers in them. So think about it. That, that's fear. But um, Hebrews calls it unbelief. What didn't they believe? 
they didn't believe that God would bless them to go into the land and take it and bless them to be able to overcome the strength of these giants. I think that's one of the number one reasons I tend to not labor. And I believe it's probably true for many of you. Back in Hebrews now, um, just think about some of the things in my job at, at the school. Some of the things that cause me not to try is that I'm scared that I won't be able to do it. That God won't bless me to be able to do it. Some of the reasons that I'm scared to speak in front of people is because God won't, Mo, Moses had that fear. Moses didn't believe that God would bless him to be a leader and to be able to speak to Pharaoh and to the, peop, the children of Israel. Um, that's unbelief. That's not believing in the power of God. And I, I encourage you to get past that unbelief Believe that God will bless you to be able to do your jobs well um, and that he'll bless you to be able to work in the cause of Christ spiritually and to help others and to teach others. Don't be afraid to do those things. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 now. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore. This is all in context with the fact that the children of Israel had unbelief and didn't enter into the rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief as the children of Israel. So I pray the Lord will bless us to go out and help those that are needy, that are sick and afflicted, to pray for them, but also to be there for them, to cook meals for them, to clean their houses, to visit with them and to talk with them. That he'll bless us to teach others and help others that oppose themselves in sin. That he'll bless us to work six days and rest on the seventh day and to work hard. One last thing that I, that I forgot to mention here. A lot of us work and we have this mentality of working just enough to get by. We go to our jobs and we do everything that we're supposed to do. We work just enough to get by. And spiritually, well, I go to the nursing home service once a month. That's enough. I, I've, I've checked that off. I go to the nursing home. I visit. Um, I think some of us have that mentality of working just enough to get by. And I want to tell you the truth is if you have that mentality and you work just enough to get by, you will not experience this rest that he's talking about. If we labor fervently and for the glory of God, then we will enter into this rest in our soul and in our spirit each day. Thank you for listening. I pray God will bless us to labor and to enter into his rest. Thank you.